David, a young hero. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. When David, the youngest son of Jesse, was a boy, he often took care of his father's sheep. In the beauty and quiet of the hills around Bethlehem, he had time to think about God and often worshipped him with the singing of psalms. Little did David dream that someday the Lord would send the great prophet Samuel to his father's house to anoint a future king of Israel. God had told Samuel to go to Bethlehem and there anoint one of Jesse's sons. When Samuel arrived at Jesse's home and saw Eliab, the oldest son, he was sure that this must be the one whom the Lord had chosen. But God said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or his height, because I have rejected him. The Lord does not see as man does. Man looks on outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. And Jesse had seven of his sons come before Samuel. But God didn't show that any of them should be anointed king. Are these all the sons you have? There is still another, the youngest. He is out in the field looking after the sheep. Then send for him at once. When Samuel saw the ruddy, handsome youth, he was impressed. And the Lord said to Samuel, Anoint him. This is the one I have chosen. Many years would pass before David would sit on the throne of Israel. But this anointing meant that God had chosen him to be the future leader of his people. And the Spirit of the Lord came on David mightily from that day on. The Lord had rejected King Saul because of his disobedience. Although Saul continued to rule Israel, the Spirit of the Lord no longer was with him, and he would sink into black moods of anger and despair. One day, Saul's servants suggested a way in which he might be helped. O oh, King, an evil spirit is tormenting you. Why don't you order us to find a man who is skillful in playing the harp? When the evil spirit troubles you, have him play, and you will be well again. Go and find such a man. Bring him to me. In Bethlehem I saw a son of Jesse who was skillful at playing. His name is David. He's a man with courage. He also knows how to speak well. He's handsome, and the Lord is with him. Bring that musician to me at once. As the king's servants had hoped, David's playing proved helpful. His music soothed Saul. And whenever the black moods left him and he was well again, the king would let David return to his father's home at Bethlehem. After a time, King Saul and the Israelites faced new trouble. The Philistine army invaded Judah and drew up for battle near the town of Soko. Saul also gathered together an army and camped on a hill opposite them. And the Israelites trembled with fear when they saw the champion which the Philistines sent out to challenge them. His name was Goliath, a giant almost ten feet tall. He wore armor of bronze and carried a huge spear. And he shouted a challenge to the men of Israel every day. Why don't you come out to fight? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not Saul's men? Choose a man from among you and send him to me. 
if he kills me, we shall be your slaves. But if I kill him, then you shall be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man so we can fight. But all of the Israelites were terrified when they heard Goliath. And Saul, too, was frightened by Goliath's challenge. Day after day, Goliath repeated his challenge. And day after day, the men of Israel became more afraid. King Saul promised great riches and his daughter as a wife to anyone who would kill the giant. But no one had the courage to try. Now three of Jesse's sons were in Saul's army, and their father sent David to find out how his brothers were getting along and to bring gifts of food to them and their captain. While David was with his brothers, the voice of Goliath was again heard in the camp, challenging the Israelites as before. I defy the armies of Israel. Send me a man so we can fight. What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine, who's put shame on all of Israel? Who is this heathen that he can insult the armies of the living God? Eliab, David's oldest brother, became angry when he heard David speaking so bravely and scolded him harshly. But when some others heard what David had said, they reported it to Saul. King Saul was overjoyed to learn that someone had been found to fight the champion of the Philistines until he saw who he was, a mere youth, a simple shepherd dressed for the pasture rather than the battlefield. But David spoke confidently to the king. No one need be afraid. I will fight this Philistine. You cannot fight the giant. You are but a youth. And he has been a warrior from his youth. I take care of my father's sheep. And once when a bear came, took a lamb from the flock. I went after him, struck him down and snatched the lamb from his mouth. Once when a lion came, I caught him and killed him too. I killed both the lion and the bear. And this Philistine shall be as one of them, because he has insulted the armies of the living God. The Lord who saved me from the lion and the bear will save me from this Philistine. Go, and the Lord be with you. Because of David's great faith in God, the king no longer tried to hold him back. Saul had little hope, especially when David refused to wear the king's armor. David went and picked out five smooth stones from a brook and put them in his shepherd's bag. Then, with his staff in one hand, and his sling in the other, he approached the Philistine giant. Goliath had shouted his challenge at the Israelites for many days and had received no answer. Now, suddenly, he saw a challenger coming. But what a challenger. A mere youth, seemingly unarmed with nothing but a staff in his hand. And Goliath made fun of him. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? Come to me and I shall feed your body to the birds and animals. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you've insulted. Today the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and the whole world will know that Israel has a God. David spoke with such confidence that for a moment, Goliath hesitated. But when he looked again and saw how small and defenseless this young shepherd really was, the giant was sure of victory. So the mighty champion of the Philistines came forward to fight the small young man. Then David took one of the stones from his bag and placed it in his sling. Unaware of David's intention, Goliath came closer. But by then, David was already swinging his slingshot and the stone from it struck the giant on the forehead. <laughs> Then David ran and stood over the stricken giant lying on the ground. After which he picked up Goliath's huge sword. 
With great effort he raised the heavy sword with both hands and brought it down with all his might, killing the Philistine giant. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they ran away. And the men of Israel started to shout and pursued the Philistines and won a great victory. After David's victory over Goliath, the king welcomed him to the palace and treated him with royal favor. But even more, David was rewarded with the friendship of Jonathan, the king's son. And Jonathan gave David his most valued possessions, his belt, his royal robe, his sword and bow, as a sign of deep and lasting friendship. Before long, King Saul became jealous of David, especially after he heard the women singing his praises in the street and saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. David gets praise for tens of thousands, I for only thousands. What more can he get but my kingdom? From that day on, Saul planned to kill David. The next day, when David played before the king, his music failed to calm Saul. Instead, the jealous ruler hurled a spear at him in an angry rage. But the spear missed David, who jumped aside and hurried away. After this, Saul made other attempts on David's life, but without success, for the Lord was with David. But when Saul continued to plot against him, Jonathan came before the king to plead for his friend. Don't sin against David. He's not sinned against you. He risked his life for you. He killed Goliath and the Lord gave Israel a great victory. You saw it and were delighted. Why then do you want to murder David without a reason? As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. But Saul failed to keep his promise and made further attempts on David's life. One day, David hid in a field where he waited for a message from Jonathan, who had promised to tell him when it would be safe to return to the palace. After three days, Jonathan came to the field and gave the signal that had been agreed upon. He shot three arrows from his bow and sent a boy to pick them up. Isn't the arrow far beyond you? Hurry, don't stand there. When David heard what Jonathan said, he knew that he must flee for his life, that he would never be safe in the palace while Saul was king. As soon as Jonathan had sent the boy away, David came out of his hiding place, and the two friends tearfully said goodbye. Go in peace, for we have both sworn in the name of the Lord. We said, the Lord be the witness between you and me, and between your descendants and mine forever. Then David and Jonathan parted, and David went into hiding in the wilderness. There he was to suffer troubles and persecution that he might become a good king, a man after God's own heart. David, King of Israel. David of Bethlehem, conqueror of the giant Goliath, and once the favorite of King Saul, was hiding in the wilderness of Judah, living in a cave like a hunted animal, because the king was jealous of David and wanted to kill him. But David was not alone. Some 400 men from all over Israel joined David. 
men who were dissatisfied, in trouble, or in debt, and David became their leader. One day, word came to David that some of his people were in trouble. The Philistines have attacked Keilah and are robbing the people of their grain. Shall I go and fight these Philistines? If we're afraid here in Judah, how much more than if we go to Keilah? David's men were afraid to come out of their hiding place because King Saul would find out where they were. But as always, David turned to God for guidance. Shall I go and fight these Philistines? Then God gave David his answer. Go down to Keilah and fight, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. Confident of what God wanted him to do, David no longer hesitated. He got ready for battle. When King Saul heard that David and his men had defeated the Philistines at Keilah, he was sure that now he could capture David. God has given David into my hand, for he shut himself in by entering a town that has walls and gates. Tell all my soldiers to get ready to go down to Keilah. We will surround David and his men. He shall not escape me this time. But once again, David was protected, for God had warned him of Saul's plan. So David and his men hurried out of the city of Keilah and hid in the wilderness of Zip. Here, one day, David had a happy meeting with his dear friend Jonathan, the son of King Saul. Don't be afraid, for my father will not find you. You will be king of Israel, and I'll be with you. My father also knows that this is so. If your words prove true, Jonathan, and I am king someday, then I'll keep my covenant with you. You'll always be my closest friend, and nothing shall come between us. I swear it before the Lord. So David and Jonathan renewed their vows of friendship, and though they were never to see each other again, David would always treasure the memory of this prince, who had been a loyal friend, even at the risk of his father's anger. David and his men wandered from place to place, hiding in the woods or in mountain caves. And wherever they went, Saul followed, with an army of several thousand men. One day it happened that King Saul and his army passed near a cave in the wilderness of Angedi, where David and his men were hiding. And Saul himself went into the cave, not knowing that farther back in the same cave was the man he was hunting. Here in the darkness of the cave was David's chance to get rid of his enemy, or so David's men believed. This is the day in which the Lord told you when he said, I will turn your enemies over to you and you can do with them what you like. But all that David would do was to creep up and cut off a piece of Saul's robe. Then he went back into the shadows of the cave. When David refused to harm Saul, his men wanted to kill the king, but David wouldn't let them. The Lord has forbid that I should lay hands on the one whom the Lord has anointed to be the king. My Lord, 
The king. The king. Why do you listen to these men who say David is trying to harm you? Today you can see how the Lord delivered you to me in the cave. My men wanted me to kill you, but I spared your life. See, my Lord, the corner of your robe is in my hand. You can see that I don't intend to kill you or rebel against you. I cut off the corner of your robe but didn't kill you. I haven't sinned against you, though you hunt me and are trying to kill me. May the Lord punish you, but I will not lay hands on you. You are a better man than I, for you have done good, and I have repaid you with evil. May the Lord reward you for what you've done to me this day. I know you will certainly become the king, and the kingdom of Israel will become powerful under you. Once again, David's love and loyalty had softened Saul's heart. So for the time being, the repentant king forgot his jealousy and returned home with his army. However, just as before, Saul's change of heart lasted only a short time. He was soon back with his army, searching for David in the wilderness of Zip. But again, God showed that he was on the side of his faithful servant David when he caused King Saul and all his men to fall into a deep sleep. And while they slept, David and his nephew, Abishai, entered the camp and made their way to where Saul was sleeping. God has sent your enemy to you. Let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of the spear, and I won't have to try a second time. Don't kill him. For who can harm the one whom the Lord has made king and not be punished? As the Lord lives, the Lord will punish him. The day will come when he will die a natural death or die in battle. The Lord forbid that I should lay my hand on the one whom the Lord anointed. Take his spear and his water jug and let us go. Then David went to a hill on the other side of the valley and called down to Saul's men telling them that they hadn't guarded their king well, for they had let an enemy come into the camp and take his spear and water jug. When Saul awoke and heard David's voice, he realized that David had again spared his life. Once more the king felt ashamed and promised to stop trying to kill David. My son, I have sinned. Come back, David. I will not try to harm you again. But King Saul had broken his promises too often. David could no longer trust him. And so David left the country of Israel and went to live in the land of the Philistines. There he was to stay with his family and his faithful followers as long as Saul remained king. More than a year, David stayed in the land of the Philistines. Then one day, a messenger came from the land of Israel with the news that Saul was dead. Having died on the battlefield, Saul's royal crown and armband were brought to David. Now David forgot all the evil the king had done against him, and he sincerely mourned for him and for his friend Jonathan, who had died in the same battle. How the mighty are fallen. How the mighty are fallen.
After Saul's death, David lived in Hebron. There, the elders of Judah had anointed him. But seven years passed before all the other tribes of Israel were ready to anoint him as their king. When Ishbosheth, another son of Saul, died, the elders of the people came to David in Hebron. Even in the past, when Saul was our king, it was you who led Israel into battle. And the Lord told you, you shall be shepherd of my people Israel, and you shall be prince over Israel. So once more David was anointed to be king, this time over all the twelve tribes of Israel. So God's purpose in sending Samuel to anoint David many years before was now fulfilled. Now David was ruler over a great people, and God blessed him and gave him many victories over his enemies. But David remained humble and God-fearing, and honored God in all things. David's love for God led him to build a new tabernacle for the Ark of the Covenant, and to bring the Ark to Jerusalem. A great crowd of Israelites gathered to celebrate the moving of the Ark. This was a happy day, because the Ark was a sign of God's presence and many hadn't seen it since its capture by the Philistines. But though the Ark had been brought back to Jerusalem, David wasn't satisfied. He gave his reasons to Nathan, a prophet. I am living in a cedar palace, and the Ark of God is kept in a tent. What is on your mind? I want to build a temple to honor God a beautiful house of the Lord in which to worship Him, and a place to keep the Ark of the Covenant. Go, do everything you have in mind, because the Lord is with you. That same night, however, the Lord spoke to Nathan, revealing that not David, but David's son, would have the honor of building the temple. And Nathan told David all this, and also God's wonderful promise for David's son. He shall build a house for my name, and I will make the throne of his kingdom stand forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. If he sins, I will punish him, but I will not take my mercy away from him as I took from Saul. Your royal house and your kingdom will stand forever. As David listened, he was filled with gratitude and went into the tabernacle to pour out his heart to the Lord in prayer. Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my family that you have blessed us so much? And yet even this you consider not to be enough. You have given me great promises for the future of my family. Yes, future generations would carry on the work that David had begun. And in this promise, David was content. His son Solomon would someday build a beautiful temple as a house for the Lord. And still another descendant of David, the Messiah, would one day build a more lasting structure, a spiritual temple that would last forever. God's church in the hearts of his people. Joseph, the young man. Almost 4,000 years ago, there lived in the land of Canaan a man with great wealth and many sons. His name was Jacob. And like his father Isaac and his grandfather Abraham, he too was a worshiper of the one true God. Jacob loved all his twelve sons, but his favorite was Joseph, because he was born when Jacob was old and was a lad with a humble faith in God. To show his love for Joseph, Jacob had given him a beautiful long robe, and when his brothers saw that their father loved Joseph more than any of them, they hated Joseph. They hated him even more because of two dreams he had. Father, I had another dream last night, a dream even more strange than the one before where my brother's bundles of grain bowed down to my bundle. What was it, Joseph? Well, this time, the sun, the moon, 
and eleven stars were bowing down to me. What's the meaning of this dream? Am I, your mother and your brothers, all to bow down to the ground to you? Dreams were not taken lightly in those days, for God sometimes revealed his plans to people in dreams. So Jacob kept in mind what Joseph had said. But his brothers were so jealous of him, they secretly wished they were rid of him once and for all. After some time, Jacob sent Joseph to the pasture land of Dothan, where the older brothers had taken Jacob's flocks of sheep to graze. Eager to see his brothers, Joseph made the long journey from Hebron, looking forward to some happy greetings from them. But when the brothers saw him coming, they began to plot against him. Look, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we can say that a wild animal has killed him. <laughs> and we'll see what becomes of his dream. No, don't kill him. Throw him into this empty pit. Leave him here in the wilderness, but do not kill him. Reuben planned to rescue him later and send him back to his father. So thanks to his oldest brother Reuben, Joseph's life was spared. When Joseph came to them, they jumped on him and tore off the long robe he was wearing. Ignoring his cries of protest and his struggling, they forcefully dragged him and finally let him down into the empty pit. Then they made ready to sit down and eat, paying no attention to Joseph's pleas for mercy. Look, here comes a caravan. That's a caravan of Ishmaelite traders. Probably from Gilead on their way to Egypt. What's there for us to gain if we kill Joseph? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Yeah, that's a good idea, Judah. Very fine. So two of the brothers hurried out to greet the leader of the caravan, while the others went back to the pit to get Joseph out. It didn't take long for the caravan leader to realize that he could buy a slave at a bargain. Unaware of the fate awaiting him, Joseph was glad to be brought out of the pit. But when he heard the bargaining which was taking place between the Ishmaelite trader and his brothers, he soon realized that they were selling him into slavery for a measly 20 pieces of silver. from his father's home and sold as a slave by his brothers, Joseph was left with but one hope and comfort, God, in whom he trusted. And Joseph's brothers dipped his robe in goat's blood and brought it to their father, saying, We found this. See whether it is Joseph's robe or not. It is Joseph's robe. Joseph. A wild animal that's torn into pieces. Joseph! 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 Don't try to comfort me. Let me go down into the grave to my son. But as in the past, so also in slavery, God was with Joseph. He was sold to a kind and wealthy Egyptian named Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt. And when Potiphar saw how faithful and honest Joseph was, and how the Lord was with him and blessed him in everything that he did, he made Joseph the overseer of his house and all that he possessed. And on account of Joseph, the Lord blessed everything that Potiphar had. But before long, Potiphar's wife tempted Joseph to sin with her. And when he would not agree to any of her evil suggestions, she plotted how to get revenge. So when she told her husband lies about Joseph, Potiphar believed her and ordered Joseph to be thrown into prison. This was unjust punishment, 
But Joseph remembered how God had brought him through other misfortunes, and he continued to trust in God's plans for him. Also in prison, the Lord was with Joseph. Soon the prison keeper put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. After some time, Joseph became acquainted with the king's butler, who had been in charge of Pharaoh's wines, and also the king's baker, both of whom had greatly angered Pharaoh and had been thrown into prison. Why do you look so gloomy today? We have had strange dreams, and there's no one to tell us what they mean. Isn't God the only one who can tell us what they mean? But why don't you tell me what you dreamed? In my dream, I saw a grapevine. And the vine had three branches. As soon as the vine budded, the clusters ripened into grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. And I took grapes and pressed the juice into his cup. And put the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what it means. The three branches mean three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your office. And you will give Pharaoh his cup as you used to do when you were his butler. But remember me when you're with Pharaoh again. Be kind and mention me to him and get me out of this prison. For I was stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here too I have done nothing to deserve to be put into this dungeon. When the baker saw that the meaning of the butler's dream had been a good one, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. Then the baker told his dream, but this time the meaning was not a good one. In three days' time, Joseph said to the baker, you will be put to death. Everything happened just as Joseph had predicted. After three days, Pharaoh celebrated his birthday, and the baker was condemned to death, and the butler was restored to his former position. However, the butler forgot all about Joseph, and Joseph had to remain in prison for two more long years. Then one day, Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, was greatly troubled. No one, not even the wisest men of the country, could tell him the meaning of two strange dreams he had had during the previous night. He called in all the magicians of Egypt, but there were none who could tell Pharaoh what the dreams meant. At last the butler remembered Joseph and hurried to tell Pharaoh about the young Hebrew prisoner who had accurately interpreted his dream. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once. Joseph, freshly shaven and dressed in clean clothes, was quickly brought before the king. I have heard that when you hear a dream, you can tell what it means. No. I do not have such power at all, but God will give Pharaoh an answer that will help him. In my dream, I was standing on the bank of the Nile when seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the river and fed on the reeds of grass nearby. And after them, there came seven other cows, thin and very ugly, such as I had never seen in all of Egypt. And the thin and ugly cows swallowed the first seven fat cows. But when they had eaten them, you could not tell that they had eaten them. For the ugly cows were still as thin as at the beginning. Then I awoke. In a second dream, I saw seven ears of grain, full and good growing on the same stalk. And after them, there sprouted seven withered ears, thin and burned by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed the seven good ears. I told my dreams to the magicians, but no one could tell me what they mean. Pharaoh's dreams mean only one thing. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. You see that the two dreams have the same meaning. The seven lean and ugly cows and the seven empty ears 
mean seven bad years, seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. Then seven years of famine will consume the land. And that famine will be so severe that people will not remember all the food there had been in Egypt. The fact that Pharaoh has had two dreams shows that God has fully decided to do this and that he will do it soon. Now that I know the meaning of these dreams, what should be done about the famine that is coming? Let Pharaoh select a wise and understanding man and set him over Egypt. Let Pharaoh also appoint officers over the land and take one fifth of the harvest during the seven good years. Let them gather all the food of these good years and store up grain in the cities and keep it there, so that when the seven years of famine come, the people of Egypt will have plenty to eat. Can we find a man with the spirit of God in him, like this man? Since God has shown you all this, there is no one so wise and understanding as you are. You will be in charge of my palace, and all of my people shall do as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. You see. I am putting you in charge of all Egypt. So at last, God's purpose in bringing Joseph down into Egypt was becoming clear. Overnight, this God-fearing young man had risen from prisoner to prime minister, from slave to second in command of all Egypt. And now he began to see how God had chosen him to save many people from death by starvation, perhaps also his own people. And God had an even greater purpose than bringing Joseph to a position of leadership in Egypt. He was preparing for himself a people from whom the Messiah was to come. Joseph, ruler of Egypt. Egypt, land of the river Nile, of pyramids and mighty pharaohs. This is the land to which Joseph, a Hebrew lad, was brought as a slave from the land of Canaan. Here in Egypt, under God's blessing, Joseph had become the prime minister. God had made it known to Joseph that soon there would come upon the land seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of great famine. And as prime minister of Egypt, Joseph had ordered men to gather up a fifth of the food in the seven good years to store it away for the seven years of famine that would follow. Throughout the land, the storehouses of Egypt were filled. Then came the years of famine, just as God had said. Seven long years in which very little grain grew in the fields. Soon the famine which came upon Egypt also troubled other countries. Then Joseph opened the storehouses that had been filled during the years of plenty, and people from far and near came to buy grain. For only in Egypt was there food enough for all. Meanwhile, the effects of the famine were being felt also in the land of Canaan, where Joseph's father and brothers lived. There's hardly any grain left, and no more grass for the cattle. We'll have to do something soon. Our supply of grain has never been so low. But where can we buy grain? Unless we do get some grain, we shall all starve. There's none to be had in all Canaan. My sons, listen to me. Why are you just looking at one another? Why don't you do something? I've heard there's grain in Egypt. Go down to Egypt and buy grain. Go quickly, so that we may live and not die. And so it was settled. 
Jacob's sons would go down to Egypt to buy grain, that is, all but Benjamin. Benjamin was to stay at home, for Jacob had already lost Joseph, one of the sons of his favorite wife, Rachel. And he would not risk losing Benjamin, the other son of Rachel, by sending him to far off Egypt. News of Egypt's grain supplies had traveled far and wide, and many people were coming to Joseph to buy grain. As governor over the land, Joseph had great power, but he was kind and no one who came to buy grain was refused. One day, Joseph saw something that made his heart leap within him. His own brothers had come to buy grain. And as they bowed before him, Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed long ago. The dreams in which God had foretold that someday his brothers would honor him as their ruler. Seeing that his brothers did not recognize him, Joseph decided to test them. And so he spoke roughly to them in the language of Egypt. You men are spies. You have come to see where our country is weak and open to attack. Oh no, my lord. We, your servants, are twelve brothers, the sons of one man in Canaan. The youngest is with our father, and one is no more. Joseph was overjoyed to learn that both his father and his younger brother Benjamin were still alive. But hiding his feelings, he pretended not to believe his brothers and ordered them thrown into prison for three days. At the end of the three days, Joseph spoke to his brothers again, still using the Egyptian language. Through an interpreter, Joseph told his brothers, If you do what I say, you will live, for I fear God. Let one of you remain in prison, and let the rest go and take home grain to feed your hungry families. Then bring your youngest brother to me, so I can see that you told the truth. And then you shall not die. When Joseph's brothers understood that they must bring Benjamin to Egypt and thought of the grief that it would cause their father Jacob, they were filled with regret over what they had done to Joseph, and they began to talk excitedly, accusing themselves. We certainly did wrong to our brother Joseph. That's why this trouble has come to us now. And I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. So now we are being punished for the wrong we did to him. And when Joseph heard what his brothers were saying, tears came to his eyes. But he turned away so that they wouldn't see him. Now he realized that his brothers at least regretted the wrong they had done. But Joseph was not yet ready to tell them who he really was. So he had Simeon put in prison. And he ordered his servants to give each of the other brothers a sack of grain and food for the journey. Then Joseph's brothers departed not knowing that the money they had brought with them was being carried home again, hidden in the sacks of grain as Joseph had commanded. That evening, when they stopped at an inn on the way home, one of the brothers opened his sack of grain in order to feed the pack animals, and what he saw in the sack filled him with fear. My money has been returned. It was right here in my sack. The Egyptian ruler will think we've stolen it. We dare not go back to Egypt now. But what of Simeon? If we don't return, he will be killed. We must return with Benjamin. Our father will never let us take Benjamin to Egypt. What has God done to us? <laughs> As the brothers had expected, Jacob was shocked by the report of what had happened in Egypt. And he didn't want to hear a word about their taking Benjamin to Egypt. You are taking my children away from me. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. Now you want to take Benjamin away. All this is happening to me. You may kill my own two sons if I do not bring Benjamin back to you. 
put him in my care and I, I will bring him back to you. Benjamin will not go to Egypt. Well, Joseph is dead. And only Benjamin is left. If any harm would come to him on the journey, you would bring my gray hair down into the grave with me, with sorrow. So the months went by, and the famine continued. Soon, all the grain which Jacob's sons had brought back from Egypt was gone, and they were again in great need of food. When Jacob suggested that they go buy more grain, his sons reminded him of what the Egyptian ruler had said. And the man solemnly warned us, saying, You will not see my face unless your brother is with you. Why did you tell the man you had another brother? The man kept asking about our family, saying, Is your father still living? Do you have another brother? So we told him what he wanted to know. How could we know that he would say, Bring your brother to me? Let Benjamin go with me, and let us go at once so that we and you and our families may live and not die. I'll be responsible for it. If I don't bring him back to you, then let me bear the blame for it as long as I live. If we hadn't waited so long, we could have been back by now. Let me go with them, Father. I'll return to you safely. If it must be so, then... Do this. Get some of our choicest fruits and bring them to the man as a present. And also take with you twice as much money as was returned to you in your sacks. Perhaps there was a mistake. Take also your brother and go again to the man. May Almighty God grant you mercy before the man so that he will let Simeon as well as Benjamin come back with you. And so Joseph's brothers again got ready to go down to Egypt, leaving Jacob alone with no son to comfort him. This time, the welcome that Jacob's sons received in Egypt greatly surprised them. They were treated royally and told they could keep the money they had brought with them. Moreover, they were invited into the ruler's palace to await his coming and dine with him. Is your father well? The old man of whom you spoke, is he still living? Your servant, our father, is well. He is still alive. And is this your youngest brother, the one of whom you spoke to me? These men of Canaan were frankly puzzled. They couldn't understand the strange behavior of this Egyptian ruler. His unexpected kindness to them. His affection towards Benjamin. And now his sudden departure from the room. It was all very strange. But more surprises were to follow. A feast was prepared for them, at which each brother was seated according to his age, from the oldest to the youngest. And afterwards, all of them were sent safely on their way with bags of grain, even Simeon, who had been released from prison. But the joy of Jacob's sons didn't last long. Their caravan was scarcely on the way home before it was overtaken and stopped by some of Joseph's guards, who accused them of having stolen a silver cup from their master. The brothers protested in vain, inviting the Egyptians to search their sacks, promising that if the cup were found in anyone's sack, that one should die, and the rest would be slaves. Joseph.
Joseph's brothers stood before him, this time to plead desperately for their younger brother. The cup had been found in Benjamin's sack, but his older brothers all offered to bear the blame. And when the Egyptian ruler refused, Judah made a touching plea. Let me stay, I beg you, and be a slave to you. And let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back to my father if Benjamin is not with me? I couldn't bear to see the misery on my father's face if we went back without Benjamin. And now Joseph could not keep silent any longer. His brothers had shown that they were truly sorry for the wrong they had done to him. He must tell them who he is. I am Joseph. Please, come near me. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Don't feel sad or angry because you sold me here. It wasn't you, but God, who sent me here to keep people from dying. God has made me a friend and counselor to Pharaoh and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry back to my father and tell him. Your son Joseph says, God has made me ruler of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. You may live in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me. You and your children and your children's children, and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. And there I will take care of you. Then Joseph threw his arms around Benjamin, and they wept. And he kissed all his brothers and wept on their shoulders, showing that he had forgiven them. And adding to Joseph's joy was the thought that soon he would see his father again. So Joseph's brothers returned to the land of Canaan. And when they told their father that Joseph was the ruler over all the land of Egypt, Jacob could not believe them. But they showed him the gifts that Joseph had sent and the wagons to carry all their families back to Egypt. And at last Jacob accepted the happy news that he would see his beloved son Joseph again. When Jacob arrived in Egypt, Joseph hurried out to meet him in his chariot. And Jacob thanked God for his goodness in allowing him to see once more the son he so dearly loved. And in this moment of happy reunion, Jacob remembered what God had spoken to him back in Canaan. I am the Lord, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make of you a great nation. And Jacob believed God's promise that his family would become a great nation in Egypt and would return to Canaan after many years. woman. For ten years, Naomi, an Israelite from Judea, had lived in the land of Moab. She had come to this land with her husband Elimelech and their two sons because of a famine in Judea. Not long after their arrival, Elimelech had died. Then her sons had married two young women of Moab, Orpah and Ruth. Not long after their marriage, Naomi's two sons also had died, and now she was preparing to return to Judea because she had heard that the Lord was again giving her people plenty of food, and she wanted to be back in her homeland. Ruth and Orpah planned to go along with Naomi, for both girls loved their mother-in-law. She had always been kind to them and had taught them to worship the true God instead of the idols of the Moabites. So the three of them got ready for the journey to Bethlehem.
But before they had gone very far, Naomi came to a decision. Why should her daughters-in-law leave their own country? Perhaps the people in Bethlehem would not welcome them, being widows and foreigners. And so, Naomi spoke to them. Please go back, both of you, to your own homes. And may the Lord be kind to you as you were to the dead and to me. And may he give each of you a good home. No! We're going with you to your people. <laughs> Go back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Do I have any more sons who could marry you? And even if I should marry again and have sons, would you wait for them to grow up? No. No. I'm sorry that the Lord has sent me all this trouble. Your sister-in-law is going back to her people. Go with her. Don't ask me to leave you. Wherever you go, I want to go. And where you stay, I want to stay. Your people shall be my people. And your God, my God. I want to die where you die. And there I'll be buried. May the Lord punish me if I let anything but death come between us. When Naomi realized how deeply Ruth loved her, she thanked God for having given her such a loyal daughter to help make up for the loss of her husband and two sons. So Ruth and Naomi continued on their journey. When the women came to the land of Canaan, Naomi was glad to be back in her homeland again. This is the country which the eternal God promised to Abraham and his descendants. It's now my country too. Naomi had changed in the ten years she had been away from Bethlehem. But when she came to the well outside the village, some of her old friends recognized her and greeted her warmly. Is this really Naomi, the pleasant one? Do not call me the pleasant one. Call me Mara, the bitter one, for I have a bitter sorrow. My husband and my sons are dead. But Ruth, my son's wife, has chosen to come here with me, for she worships the God of Israel. Naomi's friends welcomed Ruth, somewhat coldly at first, but soon she would receive a special blessing from the Lord in this country of Judea. In order to find food for herself and Naomi, Ruth went out to the barley field. For in those days, it was the custom of Hebrew landowners to leave some stocks of grain for the poor people to gather. Now the field where Ruth gathered grain was one belonging to a man named Boaz. And when he came out to his field and saw her there, he asked his overseer about her. Who is this young woman? She's the one who came back with Naomi from Moab. She said, please let me gather grain from the sheaves. And she's been working from early morning until now. Ruth had seen Boaz at the edge of the field and had decided who he was because of his fine clothes and the way he spoke with the overseer. Now Boaz walked over to her. Don't go and gather grain in any other field. You may stay in this one. Stay with my women workers. And when you are thirsty, go to the water jars and drink. Why are you so kind to me, a foreigner? 
I've heard of all you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your mother and your father in the country where you were born and came to a people you did not know. May the Lord reward you for what you've done. May the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for shelter, fully repay you. You are most kind, my lord, for you have helped me, even though I'm not one of your servants. From the moment of her meeting with Boaz, Ruth was treated with great kindness. At noon, she was invited to sit with the workers and was given all the food she wanted. And Boaz even gave orders to his workers to pull out some stalks from the bundles so that there would be plenty of barley for Ruth to gather. By the end of the day, she had gathered almost a bushel of grain, enough food for many days. That evening, when Ruth came home, she told Naomi all that had happened how the owner of the field had been kind to her. And when Naomi heard that it was Boaz, she was very pleased. Oh, may the Lord bless Boaz for his kindness. The man is a close relative who may help us. Oh, then he also said to me, you may stay near my servants until they have harvested all my grain. It is well, my daughter. So Naomi encouraged Ruth to go to the fields belonging to Boaz. Ruth faithfully worked in the fields every day, and every evening she brought home a good supply of grain to her mother-in-law. At the end of the harvest season, Naomi's thoughts turned to the future of her loyal, unselfish daughter-in-law. My daughter, should I not try to find a good home for you? Is not Boaz, with whose servants you have been working, a relative? Tonight he threshes barley on the threshing floor. Wash and anoint yourself and put on your best clothes and go down to the threshing floor and see Boaz. From the kindness that Boaz had shown to Ruth, Naomi knew that he respected and admired her. Now Naomi felt that the time had come for Ruth to tell him that he was a close relative. For according to the Hebrew law, the closest male relative was to take care of the widows. Following Naomi's suggestion, Ruth went to Boaz, asking him to take care of her because he was her relative. And Boaz was quick to answer her. Have no fear. I'll do all that you ask, for everyone knows you're a good woman. It's true, I am a close relative, but there's a relative who's closer than I. If he will help you, well, let him do it. But if he isn't willing, then as the Lord lives, I will gladly do it with my whole heart. In this way, Boaz promised Ruth that if the man who was her closest relative would not marry her, he wanted her to be his wife. Then Boaz gave Ruth a gift of grain for Naomi to show that he also intended to take care of her. And Ruth hurried home to tell Naomi all that Boaz had said. The next day, Boaz lost no time in meeting with Naomi's closer relative. And according to the custom of the day, he asked ten elders of the city to be present at their meeting. Naomi has come back from Moab and is selling the land that belonged to our relative, Elimelech. I thought I would tell you about it and say, buy it in the presence of the elders of my people. If you want it, take it. But if you do not, then tell me, since after you, I am her closest relative. I will buy it. But if you buy the land from Naomi, you must also take Ruth, the Moabite woman, as your wife, so that her children may inherit the land. No wonder the other close relative hesitated. If he married this Moabite woman and a son were born, the property would go to that son and not to his own children. 
So the man who was the nearest relative decided what to do. I can't buy it for myself without hurting my own inheritance. You may have it. Then the man took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz to show that Boaz had the right to buy the land and also to marry Ruth. In that way, the matter was legally settled. So Boaz married Ruth and also took Naomi into his home. In the course of time, a son was born to Ruth and Boaz. And it was Naomi's privilege and joy to help take care of the child. Now God has given me another son. Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you without a son. May his name be famous in Israel. He will renew your life and bring you happiness in your old age. For he is the child of your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons. Ruth had indeed been as much of a help and comfort to Naomi as many sons would have been. And Ruth was richly rewarded, also in a spiritual way that only the future would reveal. For the child in her arms named Obed would one day have a son of his own named Jesse, who would be the father of the great King David, the ancestor of the Messiah. Moses, called by God. Many years after Joseph, the son of Jacob, ruled in Egypt, there arose a Pharaoh who held the people of Israel in cruel slavery. For this heartless Pharaoh, even the birth of a son failed to bring joy to the home of an Israelite. For he had ordered that every male child of the Israelites should be put to death. And for those who were allowed to live, the future held only hard work and cruel treatment at the hands of the Egyptians. But God had not forsaken his people. The one whom he had chosen to deliver the Israelites from their slavery had been born, and his mother Jochebed was hiding him from the Egyptian soldiers. After three months, when she could no longer hide the baby in her house, Jochebed placed him in a basket sealed with tar and left him at the river's edge where the daughter of the Pharaoh often came. And Miriam, the baby's sister, watched to see that no harm would come to him. And when the daughter of Pharaoh saw the basket among the bushes, she had one of her maids bring it to her. Filled with pity for the crying baby whom she recognized as an Israelite, Pharaoh's daughter decided to raise him as her own son. Do you want me to get a Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Yes. Go and find a woman to look after the child. So the baby's own mother was allowed to keep him until he was old enough to live in the palace. And Pharaoh's daughter decided to name the boy Moses because she had taken him out of the water. Thus it was that Moses grew up in the palace of Pharaoh and received all the training, rights, and privileges of a prince of Egypt. But one day, when he saw an Egyptian striking an Israelite, one of his own people, Moses turned on the Egyptian and killed him. The very next day, Moses saw two Israelites fighting and tried to make peace between them. He asked the one who had started the fight, Why are you hitting your fellow worker? Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? This thing is known. Now Pharaoh will try to kill me too, as soon as he hears of it. Fearing for his own life, Moses ran away into the wilderness. For forty years, Moses lived in the land of Midian. There, he married a daughter of Jethro and tended his father-in-law's sheep. But 
Often during these years, Moses thought of the troubles of his people in Egypt and prayed for their deliverance. Then one day, on Mount Sinai, Moses saw a bush on fire, but the flames did not burn it. And the Lord called to him out of the burning bush, Moses, Moses, do not come near. Take off your shoes, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have seen the misery of my people in Egypt and have heard their prayers. And I am going to deliver them from the Egyptians and will bring them to a good land, flowing with milk and honey. Come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may lead my people out of Egypt. But who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, or that I should lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? I will surely be with you, and this shall be the sign showing that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve me on this mountain. But when I come to the children of Israel and tell them, the God of your father has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? What shall I answer? Tell the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. But suppose my people will not believe me or listen to me. Suppose they say, the Lord did not appear to you. What is that in your hand? It is a rod. Throw it on the ground. your hand and take it by the tail. Now put your hand into your bosom. leprous and white as snow. Put it back into your bosom again. If they will not believe you when they see the first miracle, they will believe when they see the second miracle. I am not a good speaker. I have a slow tongue. Who made man's mouth? Did not I, the Lord? Go, and I will be with you. Lord, please send someone else. I will send Aaron, your brother, out to meet you. And I will be with both of you, and will teach you what to say and do. After this, Moses was left alone. But the will of God was clear. And as he thought of all that had just happened, he marveled that God had chosen him to be the leader of his people. And as the Lord had promised, Moses' brother, Aaron, came to the wilderness and met Moses. There, Moses told Aaron everything that the Lord had told him, and about the miracles God had ordered him to do. Then Moses and Aaron set out together for the land of Egypt. 
When Moses and Aaron came to Egypt, they called together all the leaders of the children of Israel. And Aaron told them what the Lord had said to Moses. And he did the miracles before the people. When the leaders of Israel saw the proof which the Lord had given, they believed that God had come to help his people and would deliver them from their slavery in Egypt. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord. The Pharaoh from whom Moses had fled 40 years earlier was dead, and a new Pharaoh now ruled over Egypt. But from all that Moses had seen, he knew that the Egyptians were as cruel to the Israelites as they had ever been. And Moses' heart burned within him as he faced the brutal king who oppressed his fellow Israelites. The Lord God of Israel says, Let my people go and celebrate a festival for me in the wilderness. Who is this Lord God that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and what is more, I will not let Israel go. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to our God. Why do you keep the people away from their work? Perhaps they don't have enough to do, and that's why they cry, Let's go and offer sacrifices to their God. I'll give them something to do. I will add to their burden. Give the people no more straw for their bricks. Let them go out and gather straw for themselves, yet make the same number of bricks. That will keep them busy, too busy to go and sacrifice to their God. <laughs> That day, the people had to work even harder than before. So the foreman of the Israelites complained bitterly to Moses and Aaron because they had gone to Pharaoh and had made him angry with the people of Israel. Then Moses went to the Lord in prayer, saying, Why did you send me? And the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. Pharaoh was soon to learn for himself the power of the God whom he had mocked. For the Lord caused ten plagues to fall upon the land of Egypt. In the first plague, the Nile and all the waters of Egypt were turned into blood. Then came the plague of frogs, which covered the land. And the plague of gnats and of flies, which swarmed everywhere. Time and again, messengers hurried to Pharaoh from all parts of the land, bringing news of the latest plague to fall upon Egypt. The cattle diseased, men and beasts stricken with sores. And over and over again, Pharaoh would promise to let the Israelites go, only to break his promise as soon as the plagues were lifted. Whenever this happened, the Lord sent more plagues. The harvests were destroyed by hail. Grasshoppers stripped the land and even the sun was darkened. Then came the last and most terrible plague of all, death. It struck the eldest child in every Egyptian family. Even to Pharaoh's house death came, striking down his firstborn son. And there was much grief in all of Egypt. But the plague of death did not touch the people of Israel. For, as the Lord had commanded, Moses told each man to kill a lamb and put its blood around the doorway of his house. And they called this sacrifice the Lord's Passover, because God caused the angel of death to pass over the houses of the Israelites, so that none of his people died that night. And the Egyptians, filled with fear, begged Pharaoh, saying, Let the Israelites go. So Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron to come before him that very same night. Go away from Egypt, both you and all your people. Go and serve the Lord as you have said. So after 400 years, the slavery of God's people in Egypt came to an end. And Moses and Aaron began that very night to lead Israel out of Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. Thus the Israelites left Egypt, taking with them their flocks, herds, silver and gold, 
and other valuables which the Egyptians were eager to give them. But while they were traveling toward the Red Sea, Pharaoh regretted his promise to let them go and sent his chariots to pursue them. And when the Israelites saw the Egyptians coming behind them, they were stricken with panic. Don't be afraid. Stand still. And see how the Lord is going to save you from the Egyptians. The Lord will fight for you. Then God said to Moses, Tell Israel to go forward. And the people saw how the Lord could save. For when Moses, at God's command, stretched his rod out over the Red Sea, the waters divided. And the children of Israel crossed over on dry land. When the Egyptians followed them into the Red Sea, the waters came together and covered all of Pharaoh's men. That day the Lord saved Israel from the Egyptians, and his grateful people sang a joyful song of praise and thanksgiving. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my deliverer. Moses, leader of God's people. For 400 years, the Israelites had lived as slaves in the land of Egypt. But under the leadership of Moses, God had brought them safely out of this country, through the Red Sea, and into the wilderness of sin. Once in the wilderness, there were many troubles, the desert heat, the weariness, the complaints. For there was no food in the desert, and the people were hungry. But Moses knew that God would supply their needs even in the wilderness. And God did. Every day, he sent manna for the Israelites to eat. It covered the ground every morning like white frost. One evening, he also sent quails, so the people had both meat and bread to eat on their journey. But before long, the people had a new complaint, and they turned against Moses in anger. Why don't you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Give us water. We need water. Do you want us all to die of thirst? What shall I do with these people? They are about to stone me. Then the Lord commanded Moses to take his rod and strike it against a rock. At once, water gushed out of the rock and the people drank and were satisfied. And so they journeyed on in the wilderness until they came to the place where Moses had lived as a shepherd and where he had heard the Lord speaking to him from the burning bush. There Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, came out to meet him. And Moses welcomed Jethro with joy. The next day Jethro watched while Moses sat to judge the people from morning till evening, settling every kind of quarrel and complaint. And Jethro told Moses that he was making a mistake. This is too much for you and also the people. Why don't you choose able men and make them judges over the people? Let them help you. And so Moses decided to do as his father-in-law had suggested, setting judges over the people. But judges were not enough. 
The Israelites needed laws to guide and govern them, and above all, pure and dedicated hearts. So when the Israelites reached Mount Sinai and camped at the foot of the mount, Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord descended upon it. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of Egypt. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. Then Moses wrote down all that the Lord had said and read the words of the covenant to the people. And he took half of the blood of the sacrifices and poured it against the altar, and the other half he sprinkled on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord had made on the basis of all he has said. After that, God called Moses up unto Mount Sinai to give him the laws according to which God's people were to live. Forty days and forty nights Moses stayed on the mount. But while Moses was still on the mountain, the Israelites broke the very first commandment of the Lord. For when Moses delayed his coming down from the mountain, the people had asked Aaron to give them other gods to worship. And Aaron had made them a calf of gold, which the people worshipped with sacrifices and dancing. When Moses came down from the mountain with the stone tablets on which God had written his commandments, Joshua met him. As they came near the camp, they heard the noise of the merrymaking. And when Moses saw his people worshiping the golden calf, he threw the stone tablets down on the ground in anger and broke them. that you should bring such a great sin upon them. Don't be angry, Moses. You know yourself how bad these people are. They said to me, make us a God who will lead us. As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. So I said to them, let anyone who has gold jewelry take it off. And they gave it to me. I threw it into the fire and out of it came this calf. Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come over to me. Then the whole tribe of Levi came over to Moses. And Moses told them to slay all the Israelites who had worshipped the golden calf. And so 3,000 people died as a punishment for their idolatry. The next day, Moses said to the people, I will go up again to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive your sin. So Moses returned to the top of the mountain. Oh, these people have done a great wrong. They have made for themselves a god of gold. But now, Will you forgive them their sin? If not, take my name out of your book of life. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, his name will I take out of my book. 
And afterwards, the Lord told Moses to cut two tablets of stone like the first ones. And he wrote on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which Moses had broken. And when Aaron and all the people saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining brightly, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and when they came near, he repeated the commandments of the Lord. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So Moses told the people all that the Lord had commanded him on the mount, including instructions to build a tabernacle as a place of worship for his people. The people obeyed the Lord's command and gladly brought their gifts, gold, jewelry, fine linen and skins, and silver and bronze for building a tabernacle to the Lord. Then skillful workers began building the tabernacle and the ark that would contain the stone tablets on which the commandments of the Lord God were written. And there were carvers of wood and those who worked with metals of gold, silver and bronze. And there were weavers, embroiderers, and those who sewed the cloth, linens of blue, purple and scarlet. And the work went forward until the ark and the tabernacle were completed. Then Moses and the children of Israel continued on their journey, carrying with them the Ark of the Covenant, and confident that the Lord God was with them. Later, as they came near the promised land of Canaan, Moses sent twelve scouts to explore the land. But when the spies came back to Moses, they brought back frightening reports. We can't conquer this land. All the people are giants. We are just grasshoppers compared to them. If only we had died in Egypt or could die in this wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us into this land? Just to have our enemies kill us and take away our wives and children? Let us appoint a leader and go back to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. Don't believe these evil reports. Caleb and I saw the land, and it was a good land. A land that flowed with milk and honey. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us. For God is with us. No, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, oh, and because the Israelites did not believe in God's promise, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Because all those men have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and have not trusted me now these ten times, they shall not see the land which I promised to their fathers. And so the children of Israel were made to wander in the wilderness forty years. On and on they wandered, and the way was long, and again and again they complained. So one day God sent poisonous snakes to punish the Israelites. And many of them died. Then the people repented and went to Moses. We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take these snakes away from us. We beg you. Again Moses prayed for the people, asking God to forgive them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Make a snake of copper and set it on a pole. When anyone who is bitten looks on it, he will live. Moses did what the Lord told him, and those who had been bitten and looked upon the copper snake stayed alive. So once again the people of Israel saw how the Lord was able to save them.
But the wandering in the wilderness continued until 40 years had passed and those who had not trusted in the Lord had died. Only their children remained to enter the land of promise. And at last the Israelites came to the plains of Moab. You have seen all that the Lord did for you during the forty years in the wilderness. Therefore, keep the commandments and do them. And the Lord your God will raise up a prophet for you, who will be one of you, an Israelite like myself. Listen to him, and the Lord our God will bring you to the land that your fathers owned, and you will possess it. If you will keep his commandments, which are written in the book of the law, Then Moses left the people, and he climbed the mountain of Nebo to the peak that overlooked the promised land. From here he saw all the land of Canaan, and the Lord said to him, This is the land which I promised to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it, but you shall not go over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died in the land of Moab, as God had said. And the people mourned over Moses' death for thirty days. For he was the greatest of the prophets of Israel, a man to whom God had spoken face to face, and through whom God had led his people to the promised land. Abraham, a man of faith. Abraham, man of faith, was born in the city of Ur in Chaldea eight generations after the great flood. His father was Terah, a descendant of Shem, Noah's son. But unlike Noah, Terah worshipped idols instead of the true God. In the course of time, Abraham's people moved northward to Haran and Mesopotamia, where they lived for many years. Here Terah died, and here the voice of God came to Abraham with both a command and a promise. Abraham, leave your country and your relatives and your father's home, and go to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and give you a great name, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and will curse anyone who curses you. And through you, all people on earth will be blessed. Abraham was 75 years old. It would be a hardship for him to leave his home and venture forth into a new and strange land. But Abraham had such complete faith in God's promise that he was willing to go wherever God might lead him. There was much to be done. Food had to be packed, tents taken down, herds and flocks rounded up, servants instructed. For Abraham was a wealthy man. Only one thing he lacked. He and his wife Sarah had no children, and they both longed for a son. Abraham's nephew, Lot, was almost like a son to them, having lived with them since the death of his father. So Abraham offered to take Lot along on the journey. You don't even know where this country is. How can you be sure we'll find pasture land there? Enough for all our herds. Don't worry. The Almighty God provides for those who serve Him faithfully. We must trust Him. 
go where he tells us. Now, eat heartily, for soon we must be on our way. It was a long journey, and a dangerous one, through wild desert country where there were many fierce warring tribes. But Abraham and his caravan passed through it safely, crossed the Jordan River, and came to Bethel. There, Abraham built an altar and gave thanks to God for having led them safely to this land of promise. God blessed Abraham and Canaan, and he became a very wealthy man. But trouble soon arose over pasture lands and water, for both Abraham and Lot had many herds, and their herdsmen began to quarrel among themselves. But when Abraham heard about the quarreling over the pasture lands, quarreling which threatened to harm his friendship with Lot, he was quick to offer a solution, one that showed Abraham to be a peacemaker and an unselfish man of God. Let there be no quarreling between you and me and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for you are my nephew. Doesn't the whole country lie before you? If you want to go to the left, then I will go to the right. And if you want to go to the right, then I will go to the left. It was generous of Abraham to offer his nephew first choice of the land God had given to him. But Lot didn't stop to think about that. His only concern was which to choose. Then Lot saw how the whole Jordan Valley was well watered and green. What finer spot could there be in Canaan? So Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley. Soon afterwards, the Lord spoke to Abraham, showing him that he had lost nothing by being generous. Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are. Look in every direction as far as you can see. All the land which you can see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will give you many descendants in number like the dust of the earth. Go and travel the length and breadth of the land. I will give it to you. So the years passed for Abraham and Sarah in the land of Canaan. Peaceful years for the most part. And though the Lord had promised to give Abraham a descendant in whom all nations would be blessed, and had said that Abraham would be the father of many nations, yet he and Sarah continued to be childless. And Abraham began to wonder in his heart when God would fulfill his promise. Then God spoke to him again, reassuring him. Look at the sky and count the stars, if you can. That is how many descendants you will have. So again, Abraham had God's promise. Not only would he have his heart's desire, a son, but he would also have so many descendants that, like the stars, they could not be counted. Though the fulfillment of this promise seemed impossible, Abraham believed it, and by his faith he became righteous in God's sight. Later, Abraham's faith was strengthened even more when three strangers came to him one day. At first, Abraham did not recognize these men as heavenly visitors. But when he saw them, he ran to meet them and welcomed them. If I have found favor with you, do not pass by. But let me send for a little water, then wash your feet and rest under the tree while I get some bread that you may refresh yourselves. Do just as you said. So while the visitors rested, Abraham hurried into the tent and asked Sarah to make some cakes of fine flour. And he also took a calf from his herd and had it prepared for his guests. And he brought them curds and milk. After they had eaten, one of Abraham's guests turned to him with a question. Where is your wife, Sarah? She is in the tent. I promise to return in the spring. And by then, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. 
As he heard these words, Abraham realized that this promise was from God, and he was glad to hear again that he would soon have a son. Sarah, who was listening at the entrance of the tent, laughed to herself as she thought how impossible it would be for her to become a mother in her old age. But the stranger knew what she was thinking and rebuked her. Why did Sarah laugh and think, how can I, an old woman, have a child? Is anything impossible for the Lord? Next spring when I return, Sarah will have a son. I didn't laugh. But you did. And in the spring, as the Lord had promised, Sarah gave birth to a son, and Abraham named him Isaac. And he thanked God with all his heart. The years passed, and Isaac grew to be a God-fearing young lad, the delight of Sarah and Abraham, who loved him deeply. Abraham spent many hours with the boy, teaching him the skills of hunting and giving him love and attention. But God was to test Abraham's faith once again in a way that would leave no doubt as to whom he loved the most. Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as an offering on one of the hills that I will point out to you. Sacrifice his son Isaac? How could God ask such a thing? And yet had not God said, I will make a covenant with you? Had not the Lord always kept his promises? Was this the time to lose faith and refuse to obey the Lord? And so Abraham made his decision. Next morning, Abraham arose early to start out for the land of Moriah with his son Isaac and two servants. God be with you and keep you safe. Don't worry, Mother. We'll come back soon. It's only a three-day journey. Isn't it, Father? It is, Isaac. It is. On the third day, Abraham saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his servants, Stay here. The lad and I will go over there and worship, and we'll come back to you. In his heart, Abraham still had the hope that his son would somehow be spared. But he was determined to do what God had commanded. of which God had spoken, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. The altar is ready for the sacrifice, Father. But where is the lamb? God wants you to be the lamb, my son.
Abraham. Yes, sir, Lord. Do not do anything to the boy. Now I know that you love God, for you did not refuse to give me your only son. So Isaac's life was spared. And looking around, Abraham saw a ram behind him. And Abraham took the ram and sacrificed him as an offering to the Lord instead of his son. Again the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, Because you did not refuse to give me your only son, I will bless you richly and will give you many descendants, as many as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. And in your descendants, all the people on earth will be blessed. In this way, God again promised the coming of the Messiah to a man who had passed many great tests of faith. Samuel, a dedicated man. Several hundred years after the Israelites had escaped out of Egypt and entered the promised land of Canaan, there lived a man whose name was Elkanah. This man had a wife named Hannah. Hannah had long wanted a child, and in her sorrow she often cried and wouldn't eat. When she and Elkanah went to worship at the tabernacle at Shiloh, Hannah prayed fervently to the Lord, saying, Lord, if you will give me a boy, I will give him to you all the days of his life. Eli, the high priest, saw Hannah's lips move, but hearing no words, he thought she was drunk. He spoke harshly to her until she explained. I'm not drunk. I've been praying to the Lord because my heart is full of sorrow. Well, then go in peace, and may the God of Israel give you what you ask of him. May you continue to be kind to me. And Hannah kept her promise to the Lord. When her son, whom she called Samuel, was still very young, she and her husband brought him to the house of the Lord, to Eli. I am the woman who prayed here. I prayed for this child, and the Lord gave him to me. In return, I'm giving him to the Lord as long as he lives. Then may the Lord reward you by giving you more children. And may this child become a great prophet and leader in Israel. So with a joyful heart, Hannah offered a prayer of thanks to God before going home with her husband, leaving Samuel to begin his life in the service of the Lord. The years passed, and under the guidance of Eli, Samuel eagerly learned the word of the Lord. And as the boy grew older, Eli came to appreciate more and more Samuel's love for the Lord, his ready obedience and devotion to his work. But how different were his own sons. Although Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests, they were men who despised God and caused the people to despise the worship of God in the tabernacle. But the day was coming when Eli's sons would be punished for their wickedness, as God was about to make known to Samuel. One night, soon after Samuel lay down to sleep, the Lord called to him, Samuel, Samuel, Now 
Not understanding that God was speaking to him, Samuel hurried to Eli. Here I am. You called me? No, I didn't call you, my son. Go lie down again. Once more, Samuel heard the voice calling him. Again, he got up and went to Eli. But the priest, thinking that the boy merely had a dream, sent him back to bed a second time. When you are called again, say, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Samuel. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. Then God spoke to Samuel, telling him that Eli's sons would be punished for their wickedness. Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the sad news of the punishment God would bring upon his family. He lay awake the rest of the night. The next morning, however, Eli insisted on hearing what God had told Samuel. And when he heard what was going to happen, he knew in his heart that this was only just. His sons had been wicked, and he himself had sinned in being too lenient with them. It is the Lord. May he do what seems right to him. Samuel grew, always serving the Lord faithfully, and God continued to speak to him. Soon, Israelites from every part of the country realized that Samuel was a prophet of the Lord. And it came to pass that the Israelites went to war against the Philistines, and because the tide of battle was going against Israel, Eli's sons brought the Ark of the Covenant to the battlefield hoping that it would help save the Israelites. But the Philistines won a great victory. They killed Eli's sons and carried off the Ark of the Covenant. When Eli heard the news of the battle, how his two sons had been killed and the Ark of the Covenant had been taken, he fell from his seat and died. After the death of Eli, Samuel became the ruler of the people. For many years he traveled from city to city, not only settling the disputes of the people, but urging them to serve God with all their hearts. For above everything else, Samuel continued to be a man dedicated to the Lord and a prophet and teacher of God's word. During the years that Samuel judged the people, the Philistines were pushed back from the land and their idols destroyed. So once again, the one true God was worshipped in the land of Canaan. Then one day when Samuel was old, the elders of Israel set out for his home in Ramah on an important mission. 
They wanted Samuel to give them a king to rule over them. For Samuel's sons, whom he had appointed judges over Israel, took bribes and were unfair and did not walk in the righteous ways of their father. When Samuel heard that the people wanted a king, he was very much displeased. Was not God their king? As in the past, when faced with a problem, Samuel turned to God in prayer. Then he began to point out to the elders some of the evils of having a king rule over the land. He will take your sons and make them work for himself. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your flocks, and you will be his servants. And then you will complain of this king whom you yourselves have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you. No. We want a king. We want to be like all the other nations. Our king will lead and fight our battles. When Samuel saw that the people were determined to have a king, he spoke again to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Do what they ask you, and give them a king. With a heavy heart, Samuel told the elders to return home and tell the people that they would soon have a king. The choice of a king was important, for it would affect the entire history of Israel. So once more, Samuel turned to God for guidance, and the answer came clearly. Tomorrow about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him to lead my people. The next day, Samuel saw two strangers entering the city. They were Saul of the tribe of Benjamin and his servant. They were far from home, looking for some donkeys that had been lost. Saul was very tall, a head taller than anyone else. And the Lord said to Samuel, There is the man about whom I told you. He shall rule my people. And Samuel spoke to Saul and invited him to eat with him and stay with him that night. The next morning when Saul and his servants started back to their home, Samuel went with them a short distance. After telling Saul to send his servant ahead, he said, Stand here a while that I may show you the will of God. The Lord has now anointed you to be leader of his people, Israel. Thus the Lord chose Saul to be the first king of Israel. And Samuel gave Saul several proofs by which he would know that he was to rule the people of Israel. Later, Samuel called the people together and publicly introduced Saul as the first king of Israel, saying, See whom the Lord has chosen. soon showed himself to be a great soldier. After a war with the Ammonites in which he led an army of 30,000 Israelites to victory, Samuel called the people together at Gilgal, where Saul was officially crowned King of Israel. This was an occasion of great rejoicing for the newly crowned king and the men of Israel. But Samuel warned the people, so saying, Now the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord your God and obey him, and if you and the king will follow the Lord, then all will be well with you. But if you will not listen to the Lord and rebel against him, then he will be against you and will punish you. Now, therefore, pause a moment and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not the time of the wheat harvest? I will call to the Lord, and he will send thunder and rain, so that you will see how wicked you were when you asked for a king. Then Samuel called upon the Lord, and he sent thunder and rain.
when it was over, all the people feared the Lord and Samuel very much. And they asked Samuel to pray for them. May I never sin against the Lord by no longer praying for you. And I will go on teaching you all that is good and right. Only fear the Lord. Serve him faithfully with all your heart. And consider all the great things he has done for you. But the time came when King Saul willfully disobeyed the Lord. Just before a great battle with the Philistines, he became impatient and offered a sacrifice for the success of his army in battle without waiting for Samuel to arrive, even though he knew that God had forbidden anyone except his priest to do such a thing. What have you done? You took so long in coming, and I feared the Philistines would attack us. I was forced to do this. You did a foolish thing. You did not do as the Lord commanded. Because of your disobedience, God will take away your kingdom and will appoint another king to lead his people. One who obeys him in every way. But Saul continued to ignore Samuel's warnings. And Samuel was saddened by Saul's unfaithfulness to the Lord. Then one day, God spoke to Samuel. How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king of Israel. Fill your horn with oil. I am sending you to Jesse in Bethlehem because I have chosen one of his sons to be the king. Saul with Saul rejected. Samuel made ready at once for the journey to Bethlehem to anoint a second king, a man after God's own heart. Here was a man completely dedicated to the Lord, a man who knew the will of God and did it. As a boy in the tabernacle, as a leader of God's people, as a teacher of God's word, as a prophet and a maker of kings. Gideon the Liberator. God had given the people of Israel the land of Canaan as he had promised. Under Joshua, the Israelites served the Lord and enjoyed his blessings. But as time went on, they made friends with the heathen tribes of Canaan and began to worship their idols. Chief among these was Baal, and the more the Israelites bowed down to the idol, the more trouble came upon them. Midianites, a fierce desert people from the country southeast of Israel, invaded the land robbing and destroying, taking away even the crops and animals so that nothing was left for the people to eat. Many of the Israelites fled to the mountains and lived in caves like frightened animals. In their trouble, the Israelites remembered God and again cried to him for help. Then the Lord Jehovah sent a prophet to remind the people that they had brought all this trouble upon themselves. Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the place where you were slaves. I freed you from the Egyptians and from all your enemies, and I drove out the people ahead of you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am the Lord your God, do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose country you are living. But you have not obeyed the Lord. The Israelites knew that the prophet had spoken the truth, and many of them were sorry and repented for the way they had broken God's commandment by worshiping the idols of the Amorites. Then God in his mercy planned to send someone to deliver them. One day, Gideon, the son of Joash, was threshing wheat in his vineyard, where the Midianites would not be likely to see him. Suddenly, he was aware that someone was watching him. 
An angel of the Lord had come to bring Gideon a message. But at first Gideon did not realize that this was a heavenly visitor. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of courage. If the Lord is really with us, why then has all this happened to us? And what has become of the wondrous deeds of which our fathers told us when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? For well, now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you, am I not? Lord, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least important in my family. But I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites. If you are really pleased with me, then give me a proof that you are really speaking to me. Don't leave, I beg you, until I come back and bring you an offering. I will stay until you return. When Gideon returned with gifts of bread, meat, and broth, the angel of the Lord told him to place the bread and meat on a rock and pour the broth over them. Then Gideon received the proof for which he had asked. Just as the burning bush had been a sign of God's presence to Moses, so the flaming food convinced Gideon that this was the Lord who was with him. But when Gideon turned to him again, the angel had disappeared. Then Gideon became afraid, but God spoke to him, comforting him. It is well with you. Do not fear. You will not die. Then Gideon built an altar at that place and called it Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord is peace. That same night, God spoke to Gideon again, commanding him to tear down the altar of Baal, which was on his father's land and there to build another altar where the people might worship the Lord. And Gideon said he would do this, even though he knew how angry it would make all those who worship Baal. And because Gideon feared his family and the people of the town, he didn't dare to tear down the altar of Baal by daylight. But one night, with the help of ten loyal servants, Gideon tore down the altar of Baal and built an altar to the Lord. The next morning, when the people came to worship Baal and found their altar torn down and the pillar of their goddess Asherah destroyed, they were angry. Who did this? None of us would do such a thing. I know who did this. It was Gideon, the son of Joash. Gideon must die. Let us go into man of Joash. Let he turn his heart over to us. He is right. Gideon must die. So the worshippers of Baal hurried to Joash and demanded that he bring Gideon out to them, that they might kill him. But as Joash listened, he realized that Gideon had done what was right, and he spoke against Baal in defense of Gideon. Are you fighting for Baal? Are you going to save him? Whoever fights for Baal, let him be put to death. If Baal is a god, let him fight for himself because his altar has been torn down. The worshippers of Baal realized that Joash's words were true. If the God they served were really God, wouldn't he have punished Gideon himself? So they began to have doubts about the power of Baal, and they no longer tried to punish Gideon. This left Gideon free to carry out God's plan, that he should lead Israel to victory over her enemies. Gideon's task was not an easy one. A large army of Midianites had crossed the Jordan and were camping in the valley of Jezreel. 
Moreover, the Amalekites and other tribes from the east had joined forces with them, so that Israel's defeat appeared certain. But filled with the Spirit of the Lord, Gideon sent messengers throughout Israel to call the soldiers together. And while he waited for them, Gideon asked God for another proof that he was the man who should save Israel from the Midianites. If you really are going to use me to save Israel, as you said, then give me a proof. I will lay a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If dew falls only on the fleece and the ground all around it is dry, then I'll know that you will save Israel by me, as you have said. The next morning, Gideon hurried to the threshing floor where he had spread the wool fleece. To his surprise, the ground around the fleece was perfectly dry. But the fleece was so drenched with dew that the water wrung from it was enough to fill a bowl. Then Gideon asked God for still another proof. Don't be angry with me, O Lord, if I ask for one more thing. Please let me make another test with the fleece. Let it be dry only on the fleece, and let there be dew all over the ground. The next morning, Gideon again hurried to the fleece. This time, all the ground around was wet with dew, and only the fleece was dry. Then Gideon knew that God was ready to help him lead his people to victory. Israelites must have been confident that Gideon was acting under God's direction, for 32,000 men answered the call to arms. But God told Gideon that this was too many. A victory over the Midianites might seem to come from great numbers, rather than from the Lord. Then God told Gideon to let all those who were afraid of the Midianites return home. And more than two-thirds of the soldiers did so. There were only 10,000 left. But God told Gideon, there are still too many. Take the soldiers down to the water. Place in one group everyone who laps up the water like a dog, and in another group everyone who kneels down to drink. And there were 300 who lapped the water. All the rest knelt down to drink. Then God said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped the water, I will give you the victory. Let all the rest go home. Three hundred men seem very few compared to the large army of the Midianites. But that night, to reassure Gideon, God sent him and his servant Purah to the enemy camp where they overheard the Midianites talking. I had a dream. A cake of barley bread rolled into the camp of Midian struck a tent and turned it upside down so that the tent laid flat that means the sword of Gideon a man of Israel into his hands God's given the whole camp of Midian when Gideon heard the dream explained he knelt down and thanked the Lord then he hurried back to his camp to tell the Israelites the joyful news Arise, for the Lord has given the whole camp of Midian to you. That night, the Israelites prepared for battle in a strange way. Each man carried a horn and a lighted torch hidden in a pitcher. At Gideon's command, they quietly marched toward the enemy's camp to surround it on three sides. And at midnight, when the Midianites were asleep, Gideon gave the signal for attack. The noise of the horns and the crashing of the pitchers and the glare of the torches, the shouting of Gideon's name, all this convinced the Midianites that they were surrounded by a great army. And so they ran away through the darkness, trampling and fighting each other in their confusion. Then Gideon sent messengers to the people of Israel, telling them to pursue the Midianites. And so 
Gideon and his people won a great victory, and once more, peace came to Israel. In their gratitude, the people of Israel wished to make Gideon their king. Rule over us, you, and then your son, and your grandson after you, for you have saved us from the Midianites. I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. The Lord is ruling over you. And so Gideon reminded his people that the Lord had delivered them and that they should faithfully serve him as their king. And the country had peace as long as Gideon lived and the people remained true to God. Jacob, bearer of the promise. Almost 4,000 years ago, a man named Abraham heard the call of God and left his home in Haran to come to the land of Canaan. And now his son, Isaac, was married to a young woman of Haran named Rebekah. And Abraham was happy. For Rebekah was the granddaughter of Nahor, Abraham's brother, and a worshiper of the one true God a woman who would help fulfill the promise that someday all the nations of the earth would be blessed through the descendant of Abraham. The years passed, and God blessed Isaac and Rebekah with twin boys. The firstborn was named Esau because his skin was hairy. The second was called Jacob. And Rebecca often thought of something God had said to her before their birth. The older one will serve the younger. Although the boys were twins, they grew up very different in character. Esau became an expert hunter, a man who roamed the hills and forests, while Jacob was a thoughtful and hard-working man who took care of his father's herds and flocks and loved the quiet of his tent. One day Esau came home tired and hungry and smelled the food Jacob was preparing for himself. Let me have some of that right away, Jacob. I'm about to die of hunger. I will, if you will sell me your rights as the oldest son. As the firstborn son, Esau was to become the head of the family after Isaac's death and also the ancestor of the Messiah. But he answered thoughtlessly. What good is my birthright to me? Wait. First you must swear to me that you'll do it. Swear. As the Lord lives, I swear it. You shall have all my rights as firstborn. In this way, Jacob gained the rights of his older brother. And he was glad. Because he saw that all the promises which God had made to Abraham would now belong to him and to his own family. As Isaac grew older, his eyesight became so poor that he could not see. Fearing that he might not live much longer, he decided the time had come to give his firstborn son the blessing which would place Esau at the head of the family. Esau, my son. Yes, father. I am old. I do not know when I'm going to die. Now then, my son, go take your quiver and your bow and hunt some game for me. Then prepare a delicious meal just as I like it. Then bring it to me to eat and then I will bless you. Yes, Father. When Rebecca heard this, her heart rebelled at the thought of the blessing going to Esau. Had not God said, the older one shall serve the younger? Prompted by her love for Jacob, Rebecca decided to act quickly to make sure that the blessing of the firstborn would not go to Esau, but to Jacob. I just heard your father tell your brother Esau, get me game and prepare me some food. Then I will bless you. Now, Jacob, do what I tell you. Go quickly to the flock and bring me two young goats, and I will prepare the food for your father just as he likes it. And you must bring it to your father to eat, 
and have him bless you before he dies. Jacob had openly obtained the rights of the firstborn from Esau. But should he deceive his father in order to get his blessing? In his heart, Jacob was troubled. But he expressed only one fear. Mother, you know that Esau is a hairy man while, while I am smooth. Suppose my father touches me, then I'll bring a curse on myself instead of a blessing. Let any curse that can fall on you be on me. Just do as I say and go. Get the goats for me. Rebecca had planned well. She put Esau's best clothes on Jacob and fastened pieces of goat skin on his hands and neck so that they were no longer smooth and Rebecca gave him the food which she herself had prepared. At first, Isaac had some doubts as to who was in the room. The voice was like Jacob's, but when Isaac felt the hairy hands and noticed the smell of the fields on his garments, then he believed that this was really Esau, his oldest son, and he gave Jacob his blessing. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fertile places of the earth with plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down before you. Be the rule over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down before you. Cursed be those who curse you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Jacob now had the blessing of his father, and worried over what he had done, he hurried away. And not a moment too soon, for he scarcely had disappeared when... My father, here is the game I prepared for you, that you may bless me. Who are you? I'm your firstborn son, Esau. Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall stay blessed. Bless me too, oh my father. Then his father answered saying, You will live away from the fertile places of the earth and away from the dew that falls from heaven. And full of hate for his brother, Esau said to himself, My father will die soon, and then I'll kill Jacob. Rebecca was certain that unless the brothers were separated at once, there would be bloodshed and grief. So she told Isaac that the time had come for Jacob to find a wife, and that he must not marry someone outside of his own people as Esau had done. Do not marry any of the women of Canaan, but go to the plain of Syria and marry a daughter of Laban, your mother's brother. Yes, father. Then Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him on his journey. Now Jacob would be safe from Esau's anger, but his leaving meant that Rebekah might never see her beloved son again. So Jacob left the only home he had ever known. That night as he slept, Jacob had a strange and wonderful dream. He saw a ladder standing on the earth and the top of it reaching up to heaven. And the angels of God were going up and down on it. And the Lord spoke to Jacob in his dream saying, I am the Lord, the God of your grandfather Abraham. The land on which you are lying I will give to you and to your descendants. And by your descendants all the people in the world will be blessed. And now I shall be with you and will protect you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. Surely 
me the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Oh, what? It's nothing less than the house of God. And here is the gate of heaven. morning, Jacob rose early and took the stone on which he had rested his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. And Jacob made a solemn vow to the Lord. If you will be with me and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear so that I come back safely to my father's house, then you will be my God and I will give you a tenth of everything you give me. Then, assured of God's favor and strengthened by his promises, Jacob continued his journey to Haran, toward the home of Laban, his mother's brother. And when Jacob at last arrived in Haran, he saw some shepherds resting by a well, and he asked them about his uncle. Laban, the grandson of Nahor? Yes, we know him. Is he well? Yes, he's well. See, here comes his daughter Rachel now to water his sheep. Rachel, the younger daughter of Laban, was beautiful. And when Jacob saw her, he rolled the stone from the opening of the well and helped water the flock. Then Jacob told Rachel, I'm Rebekah's son. And she hurried to tell her father so that he would come out to welcome Jacob. Jacob stayed at his uncle's place, and although Laban had an older daughter, Leah, Jacob fell in love with Rachel, and he agreed to serve his uncle seven years if he could marry Rachel. But because Laban wanted to have his older daughter married first, he tricked Jacob. And at the end of the seven years... What did you do to me? I worked for you for seven years in order to have Rachel as my wife. Why? Why, then, did you cheat me? In our country, we do not give a younger daughter in marriage before the oldest one. But you may have Rachel, too, if you'll agree to work for me another seven years. So Jacob, who had deceived his father, was now learning how painful it is to be deceived. But because of his deep love for Rachel, he agreed to his uncle's terms. As the years passed, Jacob prospered greatly. The Lord gave him a large family and many flocks and herds. But still his heart was not at rest. He longed to see his homeland again, to make peace with his brother Esau. So with his family and his servants and all his flocks, Jacob journeyed from Haran and crossed the Jabbok River where they camped for the night. Twenty years had passed since Esau had threatened to kill Jacob. What if Esau had not forgiven him for taking his blessing? The night before he met his brother, Jacob turned to the Lord in prayer and wrestled with him until daybreak. Because Jacob firmly clung to God in faith, God told him, Your name will be Israel, for you have fought with God and have won. But in the struggle, Jacob's hip was injured. And from that time on, he walked with a limp. In the morning, Jacob hurried ahead to meet his brother, to whom he had already sent gifts with which to win his favor. And when Jacob saw Esau approaching, he bowed low seven times to show his desire for his brother's love and friendship. So 
So the years of bitterness were over, and the two brothers were again at peace. But one more reunion awaited Jacob, the reunion with his father Isaac, who was still living. Many long years had passed since that day when Isaac, believing that he was about to die, had given his blessing to Jacob. But now, with Jacob before him, safe at home again, with a family and great possessions, Isaac felt certain that God's will had been done, and that his son Jacob was indeed the rightful bearer of God's promise. Joshua, the Conqueror. The people of Israel were camped on the border of the land of Canaan. Under the leadership of Moses, they had been delivered from slavery in Egypt and had lived in the wilderness 40 years. Before his death, Moses, by God's command, had chosen a new leader for his people. His name was Joshua. As a young man, Joshua had explored the land of Canaan. It was he who had fearlessly urged the people to enter the promised land. And it was he who, during their wanderings, had worked side by side with Moses. Now, God was directing and encouraging Joshua as he had Moses. My servant Moses is dead. Arise, cross the Jordan River, you and all the people of Israel, into the land which I am giving them. Joshua's great moment had come, but his task seemed beyond human strength. For at this time, the Jordan was swollen by floods and was too deep and swift for the people to wade across. But God reassured Joshua, Do not be afraid and terrified, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. When Joshua heard these words of the Lord, he decided to tell his people to prepare at once for the crossing of the Jordan into Canaan. It would take several days for the Israelites, numbering many hundreds of thousands, to move from their encampment to the banks of the Jordan. Meanwhile, Joshua decided to send men ahead to spy out the land, especially the city of Jericho, which lay just beyond the river. Find out how strong the city is, the size of its walls, and the number of its soldiers. For we must take Jericho before we can go any farther into the land of Canaan. Now go, and God be with you, and bring you back safely. The spies were careful. Nevertheless, they were seen entering a certain house in Jericho, and soldiers hurried there to capture them. A woman named Rahab lived in that house, and the soldiers spoke roughly to her. Bring out the men who came to your house. They are spies. Some men did come to me, but I did not know where they were from. And uh, just about the time the gate was to be closed after dark, the men went off. If you hurry, you can catch up with them. But it was God's will that the spies should not be captured. Rahab had hidden them in a safe place. Then Rahab explained to Joshua's men why she had helped them. I know that your Lord has taken our country and that everybody is afraid of you. There is no courage left in any of us because the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. We've heard how your God dried up the waters of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. Now swear to me before your God that as I have been kind to you, you will also be kind to me and save my mother and my father and all my family. Our lives for yours. If you'll not tell why we came here, we'll treat you kindly when the Lord gives us this country. The spies promised that they would spare Rahab and her family when Jericho was attacked. A scarlet cord hung in her window would mark the house as that of a friend. With Rahab's help, the spies safely escaped from Jericho and hurried back to Joshua with their report that the whole country feared the people of the Lord. At 
last the day came to enter Canaan. Confidently, Joshua urged the people to go forward. The rushing waters of the River Jordan did not frighten him, for God had told him what to do. As the Lord had commanded, Joshua told the priests to go first, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And as the priests stepped into the River Jordan, a wonderful thing happened. Just as at the Red Sea, so here too, God provided a dry path for his people. As long as the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant remained in the riverbed, the waters to the right of them stood as a wall. At God's command, Joshua set up stones on the other side of the Jordan near their camp at Gilgal to remind the people of how the Lord had again helped them by his mighty power. One man from each of the twelve tribes of Israel had brought a stone from the riverbed over which they had passed. And Joshua spoke to the people. When your children in time to come ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Then you shall tell them, the Israelites crossed over this Jordan on dry ground. The Lord, your God, dried up the waters of the stream just as the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Red Sea. He wants all the people of the world to know how mighty his hand is and he wants you to fear him forever. Now the gate of the city of Jericho was shut up tightly. No one came out or went in for the people of Jericho were afraid of attack from the army of Israelites camped outside the city. And when Joshua went out to look at the city and saw the great walls, he wondered how they would ever be able to take the city. But as he stood there in deep thought, he suddenly saw someone near him. It was a man dressed like a soldier and carrying a bright sword in his hand. So Joshua questioned him. Are you one of us or one of our enemies? Neither. I am the captain of the Lord's army. What does my Lord have to say to his servant? Take off your shoes, for the place where you are kneeling is holy. Joshua quickly obeyed his heavenly visitor. And then as he listened, the Lord made known his plan for taking Jericho, a plan which Joshua followed when he attacked the city. The next day when the people of Jericho looked out of their windows, they saw a strange procession moving around the walls of the city. First came a company of armed men marching along silently. Then came seven priests, and behind them came more priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant. Then came more soldiers, but they made no move to attack the city. It was all very strange. They were marching silently around the city with no noise but the sound of their feet on the ground. Once around the great stone wall they marched. Then they returned to their camp at Gilgal. The people of Jericho were puzzled and afraid. Why didn't the Israelites attack the town? What did they mean by this strange silent march around the city? When the Israelites had marched around Jericho every day for six days without any harm coming to the city, some of the people of Jericho began to ridicule their enemy. But Rahab was certain that the Israelites would soon capture Jericho. So she hung a scarlet cord in her window as Joshua's spies had told her to do. On the seventh day, the people of Israel marched around the city again, not once, but seven times. The seventh time, the priests blew loudly on their horns. And Joshua cried out to his people and said, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Then all the people made a great noise, and at the sound, the walls of Jericho began to fall.
the Israelites rushed into Jericho and took the city. But Rahab and her family were spared, as the Israelites had promised. Then all the gold and silver and other valuables found in the city were collected for the treasury of the Lord. For God had commanded that no man should take anything for himself. But a man named Achan disobeyed the Lord. He hid some treasures in his tent. And because of his sin, the children of Israel, who had just won a great victory, were soon to taste the bitterness of defeat. A few days after their glorious triumph at Jericho, the Israelites had attacked the city of Ai, which was much smaller and weaker. Yet Israel had been badly defeated. Joshua couldn't understand what had gone wrong. Why had God suddenly turned against his people? So Joshua again prayed to the Lord. And God revealed to him that one of the Israelites had committed a great sin. Then God told Joshua how to find the man who had brought defeat to the Israelites and ordered that he be punished. When Joshua followed the Lord's direction, the guilty person proved to be Achan. My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Tell me, what have you done? It is true. I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian robe, 12 pounds of silver and a bar of gold weighing two pounds, I wanted them. So I took them. They're buried in the ground in the middle of my tent. So Achan was put to death, and all that he had was burned to ashes because he had taken what belonged to the Lord. After this, the Israelites marched against the city of Ai once more and won a complete victory. Then they built an altar to the Lord at the foot of Mount Ebal. And there Joshua read aloud to the people the law that God had given Moses. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet. And now, having heard the word of God, the people of Israel were ready to go forward to new victories in the land of Canaan. Taking city after city, the Israelites moved farther into the promised land until the Canaanites were defeated and driven out. But it took many years before the land of Canaan became the land of Israel. And when Joshua was old, he called all the tribes together at Shechem that he might speak to them once more and remind them of all the good things God had given them. He also warned them of the punishment that would come upon them if they disobeyed the Lord. And if you sin against the commandments of the Lord your God and worship other gods, then God will be angry with you and you will perish quickly and your descendants will lose the good land which he has given you. The people listened carefully to Joshua, for never had his words been more serious. Then he spoke of God's guidance and care for the Israelites. From the time of Abraham, to this present day. Fear the Lord and serve him sincerely and faithfully. Put away the idols which your ancestors served and serve the Lord. And if you will not serve the Lord, then choose this day whom you will serve. Either the idols your ancestors served on the other side of the river or the idols of the people of Canaan where you are now living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Then the people said, We too will serve the Lord. The Lord is our God, and him we will obey. And so it was that through the great leader Joshua, 
Israel served the Lord and continued to serve him as long as they remembered what the Lord had done for them.